Uh, at any rate, he is here to uh, talk about his experience uh, as, as an astronaut. We deliberately left the program uh, fairly loose so that uh, he could uh, discuss the things he wanted to cover and uh, answer your folks' questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Thanks again for being here. Well, actually, I, uh, I didn't come here to talk about what I want to talk about. To tell you the truth, if that were the case, I'd ask some of you guys to get up here and talk about some of the things that you've seen. But uh, I came here to discuss the things that you all want to hear, and you can turn it down a little bit if you like. And uh, I, was, I was trying to figure out that really, you know, Dan asked me to come and speak, and so I thought I'd hit the website, you know, and get some recent Hubble Space Telescope imagery or what have you. And, pictures of Mars, and I realized that if I were to bring that stuff and actually show it to you, you guys probably know more about it than I do, you know, so I didn't want to look stupid in front of you, so I thought I'd talk about flying instead, and then maybe I could trump most of it. There's always a leader in the audience, especially when they're young people, man, let me tell you. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to text through some photos. I thought we'd uh, talk a little bit about the space shuttle, how it flies, some of the things that you see in space. Uh, some of the impressions that uh, uh, the astronauts have uh, of what it's like to be up there, and which is always, which is kind of the most common question. You know, someone will walk up to you and they'll say, uh, you know, what's it like to be up there? And gosh, man, there's not a good answer. You know, the and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit. But <clears throat> this is kind of an intro to that, to the whole feelings you get from being up there. And this is a picture of the Earth's atmosphere from low Earth orbit. I mean, low Earth orbit. You know couple hundred miles. And if you guys remember ninth grade science a little better than most folks, uh, you can look at the bands, the colored bands in the atmosphere, and you can see the troposphere, the tropopause, and the stratosphere. It's all laid out there in color. And this is a sunset from Earth orbit. Um, and, the, and if you fly airplanes, if you fly airplanes, you're real familiar with clouds that look like that. Those are cumulonimbus clouds, and it means thunderstorms. Uh, hail popping out the top of it, lightning, all kinds of bad things that you don't want to be around. And those things top off about 60,000 feet. And, uh, and the reason is that the winds get pretty high up there and it just shears the tops off the clouds and they look and you get that anvil effect. So as you look at that picture of that sunset in the Earth's atmosphere, you realize there's a whole lot of the atmosphere that is up in the black. You know, you can't even see it. In fact, of course, when you're orbiting the Earth, you're impacting atomic oxygen and other molecules that actually causes drag on the vehicle, especially something like a space station where you have large solar rays. And that helps, actually, that actually accelerates your orbital decay when you are in orbit. So occasionally vehicles have to be reboosted. Now, the, uh, I'm reminded that, uh, you know, I have uh, you know, flown a bunch of airplanes and you know, since that bio is written, probably about 75 different airplanes and 5,000 hours and a few dozen combat missions and uh, first flights of airplanes and all those kinds of things. And, but however, uh, in the world of aviation and the world of flying in space, um, you can never do enough. Because you can't live long enough to have flown the first flight at Kitty Hawk and then flying at World War I and flying the Battle of Britain and the Battle of Midway and dogfights over the Yellow River during the Korean War and over Saigon, over uh, Hanoi and Vietnam and uh, Lebanon and Libya and the Persian Gulf, I was in those three. And, uh, and then, you know, everything, and then fly the first non refuel flight around the world and all that. You don't live long enough. When I, was very, when I first showed up at NASA, one of the things that I did was to start flying a, a, a Gulfstream airplane. It actually, you can configure like the space shuttle and it flies like the orbiter which means it flies pretty much like a brick. And you should drop it out the window and there it goes. It has, it has a glide ratio of about three and a half to four to one, the orbiter does. It actually is a pretty nice flying airplane. Hypersonic glider, it comes back to Earth, the engines aren't running. You guys know a lot of the details. And I'll talk in as much technical detail as you like. I really enjoy that. It's very rare that I actually talk to an audience that I can whip out any te techno technical detail without putting them immediately to sleep. You know? <laughs> Well, anyway, so I was down at the Cape and we were flying some sorties to practice our landings. And we take these things up and fly about 10 landings. And this happened to be in the middle of the night. And uh, of course, everyone else on the East Coast was asleep. And so we were, we were kind of sitting there and, uh, 
in these lounge chairs, and uh, John Young was sitting across from me. We were going to fly two airplanes in the same period. And John Young is a pretty interesting guy. He's flown in space six times, as many as many times in space as a human ever has. Uh, he flew in Mercury, he flew in Gemini, he flew uh, in Apollo, he went to the moon, flew the first flight of the space shuttle. One of the tails are pretty gutsy move. Anyway, I'd been there for about two or three weeks, and he said, you know, Joe, he said, this flying in space thing is the darndest thing. Actually, John is a country boy from West Virginia. He put it quite a different way, but regardless, we'll put it that way tonight. And he said, you know, I said, no, he said, you know, I've been around this for the longest time. He said, hey, you can never do enough. I mean, you know, I can, I, yeah, I can do all the things that I just told you about, but it's never enough for anyone. They always want more. You know, there's a young boy you run into at the Aerospace Museum, and he asks you if you've ever been to Mars. Well, gosh. Of course, uh, no one has. You know? <laughs> I haven't been to another galaxy. That's a Starship Enterprise, man. That's not the real world. Well, anyway, he said when he showed up at NASA, he was in the second group of astronauts. The original seven were already there. If you recall, there were seven flights scheduled for the Mercury space program. They flew six because Deke got that heart murmur thing and wasn't able to fly. They didn't need, really need a seventh flight, so they didn't fly him in the roll right in the Gemini. And so he. Uh, when he showed up, there was nothing for him to do, and the original seven were not going to let him have, let him or anyone else in his group, which was Jim Lovell and a bunch of other guys, you know, but names that you know. Uh, we're not going to let any of those guys have a part of Jim and I. So they basically said, hey, here's a tray of 35 millimeter slides. Go talk to some schools and come back when they're ready to fly Jim and I. So John did that, and he went out to the schools, and, and the first time that he was out there, he, he knew he had this, he's in there and he's talking about 30 kids, and he knew there was this big pink elephant in the room. And eventually someone was going to call him on it. And the elephant was, have you ever flown in space? Because you're not an astronaut. Now really, the public thinks you're an astronaut as soon as you throw on a blue flight suit. But you're not an astronaut at NASA until you've flown over 50 miles above the surface of the Earth. 300,000 feet, 50 nautical miles. He had not done that. So he gives his pitch and he talks about Mercury and he says what we're going to do in Gemini and he talks about Apollo and how we're going to go to the moon and he goes around the room and he asks if there are any questions and a young man raises his hand and he says, Mr. Young, I have a question. Of course, John was in a coat and tie, you know, because uh, everyone thought they asked, you know, we didn't want the program to be uh, militarized. By the way, most of the astronauts are military, believe it or not. Most of the mission specialists are military. But regardless, uh, the young man raised his hand and he said, uh, Mr. Young, I have a question. He said, yes, sir, what is your question? Knowing full well, the kid was looking at that big elephant in the corner of the room. And he said, have you ever flown in space? And he said, no, I've never flown in space. And he, but however, I'll probably fly in Gemini. You know, if I any luck, I might go to the moon. So he flies in Gemini. You guys know which Gemini mission he flew on? First man Gemini mission, Gemini 3. And when he was, John was still active in NASA, he used to walk around in a flight suit that had a Gemini 3 patch. That was kind of cool. You know, if you were a little kid like me watching him go fly his first flight, you know, do you know who he flew with? Gus Grissom was, his, was the commander of the flight. And they named the spacecraft, the Gemini spacecraft, Molly Brown. Because the Mercury spacecraft that Gus flew in, remember the hatch blew? And it sunk to the bottom of the uh, ocean. In fact, it's been recovered and it's up at the Kansas Cosmic now. <laughs> And it really did blow. No one at NASA believed it. And he and his wife didn't get to bed. He didn't get to go meet President Kennedy and Jack and play all the things you see in the right stuff. That was one of the things that really happened. Anyway, so he flew. First flight of a spacecraft with an onboard computer. That's kind of cool. And uh, so now he's out. He, he takes his tray of slides. He has a couple of extra ones now. He goes out into the schools and they ask questions. The little boy raises his hand and says, Mr. Young, I have a question. He goes, in his mind, he's thinking, I know what you're going to ask, and now I've got the answer for you. He says, have you ever flown in space? Because you know the attention span of kids. They only hear you know, one tenth of what you tell them. And he goes, yes, son, I have. I flew the first manned flight of Gemini, the first flight of a spacecraft with an onboard computer. And uh, another hand goes up to the back of the class, and at this point, John is convinced he can answer any question that's out there. And this young lady says, Mr. Young, how many times have you flown in space? <laughs> <laughs> Only flown in space one time. So he flies again in Gemini. He actually rendezvous with a, a Gina rocket at an apogee of 854 miles. People said it couldn't be done. Had a launch window of about 30 seconds. I mean, just everything that you read about. He comes back, it's the same thing. The first question, have you ever flown in space? I have. But he knows to not give away too much. And another hand goes up, and how many times have you flown in space? He says, Twice, a planet space twice, as many as any human being on the planet. 
Another hand goes up, and John's very confident he can answer the question, and he says, uh, the young man says, uh, Mr. Young, have you ever been to the moon? He says, no, oh, I've never been to the moon. Of course, no one's been to the moon. So he goes to the moon, he orders it, and he comes back, same thing. Have you ever gone to space? I have. How many times? Three times, more than any human being in history. Um, have you ever been to the moon? I have. I went to the moon on my Apollo mission. The last hand goes up. But Mr. Young, have you ever walked on the moon? Says, no, I haven't walked on the moon. So he goes, he walks on the moon, drives the lunar rover. You guys remember that? And uh, have you ever fallen in space? I had. Now he's like a comedian. You know, he's not going to give anything away. Have you ever fallen in space? Yes. How many times? Four times, more than any person in history. Mr. Young, have you ever been to the moon? I have. Mr. Young, have you ever walked on the moon? Yes, I have. Way in the back of the room. And he goes up, but Mr. Young, how many times have you walked on the moon? <laughs> I only walked on the moon one time. Well, anyway, he can, he can never do enough. So, you know, uh, I talked about um, all of these astronaut guys. Uh, you know, they're all military guys, almost all of them. There are really only a few real scientists, civilian astronauts. Most of them are uh, military folks. And uh, if they weren't flying in the front seat of airplanes, they were flying in the back seat of tactical airplanes like the F-14 or in the right seat of the A-6 Intruder, or they flew KC-135s as pilots or P-3s in the Navy, um, or they were actually scientists in a military service. And the reason for that is that flying in space, let, let me uh, uh, spoil something for you. Flying in space is not that much difference than, different than flying in the atmosphere. You go a lot faster. You can't make any mistakes. Um, you don't have nearly as much gas as when you fly in the atmosphere. But it's, there are many similarities to flying a rocket as there is uh, flying uh, an air-breathing vehicle. So most of the astronauts, like John Young, like myself, like Neil Armstrong, well, this is where we learned to fly in space. In our case, we were naval aviators. We learned to do it flying off of aircraft carriers. And uh, this, the for all the the difficult aviation skills that have to be exhibited to make a mission a success at NASA, where do you think, do you, what do you think the most difficult task in aviation is? Land on this thing at night. I can tell you there's nothing on the planet that approaches what it takes to land on an aircraft carrier at night, particularly if it's in a Tomcat, where the flying qualities are not superb. But regardless, uh, that's where we learned how to do what we went and did in space. It was a perfect training ground for it. And we didn't go, and, and in fact, all of the pilots are test pilots. And the, the reason that NASA went out and found test pilots to come do this work, you know, there was, like they're in the right stuff, like you see in the right stuff from reading the book, there were some, some guys that didn't know a whole heck of a lot about aviation or, or technology that at first were just looking for human bodies to stick in here and just blast off. So they were kind of looking for, I don't know, skydivers or you know, deep sea divers or uh, what have you. But anyway, we, uh, it, the skills that we built there and, and really paid off later on in the program. Um, that's just a cool picture. And by the way, you know, I, I happen to be here talking to you guys tonight. And I appreciate you coming up and saying hello. And, uh, and it's really a pleasure to be here with you tonight, and it's an honor. But let me tell you what, man, somewhere around the world right now, you know, hack your clock, uh, there are 20 to 25 Navy airplanes coming back to land on the boat, probably on a thunderstorm. Some of them may be coming back from combat missions in the Middle East. And these are the guys that are the real heroes. And they are really getting it out there for zero recognition, for very low pay, and they're putting things at risk that uh, many of us could only dream about. And old guys like me, we just wish we were back out there doing it. So go figure. When you come to NASA to fly the space shuttle, we want you to be a test pilot. And the reason is, and you've kind of seen this in the press over the last couple of years, every flight of the space shuttle is a test flight. We might test a new part of the flight control systems, uh, new computer systems, it might be a slightly different trajectory that we want to launch on. You might, uh, go, you might go up to a space station like we did with Mir and perform the, the flight tests to ensure that we can rendezvous and dock a relatively large 240,000 pound mass vehicle with a, relatively small, with a relatively small mass of the space station itself. 
And, uh, and that's where we learned how to do it, is flying flight test airplanes like this uh, F-14 right here. And by the way, uh, you guys know who built the F-14? We'll get back to this later. Grumman Aerospace. And we'll, uh, we'll tie that loose in for you here in a few minutes. This is the Space Shuttle Orbiter. Um, it's a $4 billion vehicle. It has, in the cockpit alone, and you can see about two-thirds of the switches right there, there are over 2,000 switches. There are about 15 different systems in the space shuttle, each of which is as complex as that F-14 that I just showed you on the previous slide. The main engines, the electrical system, the environmental control system, the hydraulics, the computers, the flight control system, the reaction control system, the jets that maintain your attitude on orbit, the orbital maneuvering engines, the solid rocket boosters, and the list kind of goes on and on and on. So, you know, if you want to go to NASA and you want to fly, if you're a young person, you need a technical degree, you need a hard science degree. Engineering is better than, than physics, but physics is just fine. And you need to do well uh, in your studies. And because you need to launch yourself out to go do some things very quickly in your life to hit the gate to get into the place as an astronaut. Average age of a new astronaut, 35. There's quite a bit of experience that they want you to get before you show up there. The reason being that there is no time to train you anymore. You know, you, you can't pass a physical long enough <laughs> you know, to hang around there for 30 years and finally get a chance at flying. You've got to be ready to go as a full up round the day you show up. Um, the space shuttle is uh, it's a pretty interesting vehicle, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that on this slide. <clears throat> Any of you ever had the opportunity to see a launch? I know one guy, yes, you guys have seen some launches. If you done the tour when it's on the pad, the bus takes you around the pad and back around. Usually when you do that, the structure is there that protects the vehicle, and you can't really see the thing. But, uh, but I tell you, if you've flown, this vehicle, um, you know, it's this is a pretty special thing. I mean, our country didn't build many of these. You know, not 30 miles from here, the first one that flew, it only flew in the atmosphere, Enterprise, is at the Dulles Annex of the uh, Air and Space Museum. But uh, this thing is a, a collection of <coughs> titanium, a little bit of steel, aluminum, uh, reinforced carbon, carbon, the second hardest substance known to man is the way we put it. You know, to people a little bit less of a technical bent than yourselves. Uh, it, uh, it has thermal tiles that are made of silica that are 90% air. And if you were to pick one up, it would feel like styrofoam. That's the white that's on the underside uh, or, or on the tops of the wings. And th there are insulating thermal blankets on the top of the payload bay doors the vertical tail, and in front of the windows of the cockpit. And the reinforced carbon carbon is good to about 2,000 degrees, about 800 degrees for the silica tiles, and about 300 degrees for the insulating blankets. I can give you a whole list of things that are spun off from the, pre the space program that we use every day from cordless power tools to grooved highways. But one of the things, that, interesting things that are spun off from the space program, particularly from the uh, space shuttle, is the uh, insulation that is now used at the firewall of NASCAR race cars. Those guys are burning up in the cockpits at about 180 degrees or something. And one day, one team got the bright idea to call NASA up and said, hey, do you have anything that could help us out? And they said, yeah, and they shipped them a box of it and gave them the address to the manufacturer. Now all the NASCAR teams put it on the firewall now, and it significantly reduces the heat in the cockpit for those guys. Um, there's a big orange external tank the orange that you see is foam that is sprayed on there as insulation, and you know, Lord knows it's been in the news enough lately. Uh, the solid rocket boosters burn ammonium perchlorate and aluminum powder as an oxidizer and a fuel. And uh, three space shuttle main engines in the back of the orbiter. If you look on the leading edges of the wings, that's the reinforced carbon carbon, the black. And on the nose, the black is reinforced carbon carbon. Um, the tiles are interesting things on the vehicle. Each one is completely unique. Um, each one is carved by hand. You know, it has a different thickness, a different width, a different length. And they all have a little yellow serial number on them painted by hand with this little uh, paintbrush, you know, by, one, by a guy, you know, that, or a lady, paints those things on there. And the interesting thing is the, the yellow paint doesn't burn off. 
it, remind me, I'll tell you why afterwards. But you guys ever tear down an engine when you're a kid, you know, and repaint the block, and the, and the paint always flakes off, right? You can never get it to stay on. Well, at NASA, it doesn't. Or it does stay on. The vehicle uh, weighs four and a half million pounds of launch. It's propelled by seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and it goes from zero to 60 in five and a half seconds. It'll clear the tower in that five and a half seconds, and then it will roll to place itself in the proper orbital insertion plane for your particular mission. Um, and what does that really mean? The proper angle to the Earth's equator. So if you happen to be at uh, a place like Kennedy Space Center, where that has a latitude of 28 and a half degrees, which direction do you think you would go to be able to use the thrust that you have and put the maximum amount of payload into orbit? You go due east because you get the most out of the Earth's rotation. What, what mat, by the time you clear the tower, what matters is not your speed relative to the Earth, but your inertial velocity, your speed relative to the stars. And sitting here today, we're probably going about 800 feet per second in inertial velocity as the Earth is rotating. So as you are accelerating during the ascent, there's a point in the, in the algorithm which you actually add an extra 1,000 feet per second to your velocity to give you inertial velocity. The vehicle will hit the speed of sound 48 seconds after launch at an altitude of 22,000 feet. Of course, you're, I mean, all of us had gone supersonic before it showed up at NASA, but now you're doing it almost straight up. And the vehicle will take eight minutes and 32 seconds to get into Earth orbit. During the, the, that eight minutes and 32 seconds, the three main engines in the back of the space shuttle will burn liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at a temperature of about minus 300 degrees C at the rate of one swimming pool's worth every second for eight minutes and 32 seconds. Remarkable technology. Imagine the stresses well, within that vehicle where on one side of a turbine driven pump is spinning at about 67,000 RPM and is actually spinning and being powered by hydrogen, pure hydrogen is burning to turn this thing. The other side of that pump and it's very cold, obviously, you know, minus 300 degrees. On the other side of that pump is a main combustion chamber with a gazillion degrees pumping this stuff out the back of it. Pretty interesting technology. During the ascent, the flight control surfaces of the vehicle do not control it at all. They do move in an effort to relieve the loads on the vehicle, but they're not part of the, the flight control system to get it into orbit. It doesn't control it to get into orbit. During the ascent, the three space shuttle main engines and the, and the uh, nozzles on the solid rocket boosters are vectoring to control your attitude and your trajectory. And this thing was designed back in the you know, late 60s and early 70s. And just now, in fact, the first production F-22 was just delivered. That's the first airplane that we had out there that had, has had thrust vectoring, the first production airplane. The solid rocket boosters are punched off in two minutes and 10 seconds, and it's the greatest thing from in the cockpit. You know, as a fighter pilot, you may have hit, you know, maybe Mach 2, 2.4. If you flew the SR-71, maybe 3.2 or something like that. This happens at Mach 3.7. Of course, you're still climbing in the sky. Those things are gone. You continue uphill with the external tank on your belly, and then at Mach 13.2, you'll do the world's fastest aileron roll. It's not really an aileron roll because it's actually thrust vectoring of the engines will roll you upright, and you continue uphill in an upright attitude. The solids are actually reused. Uh, the casings, I don't know, 60, 65 flights or so, and they parachute back down, and they tow up to the Cape, and then take them out to Brigham City, Utah, and refill them. And it's kind of, if you've ever, if you're ever around the vehicle while they're stacking the, uh, the solids, you can look at the rocket fuel in there, the fuel in the oxidizer. Of course, it's all solid. You know, there's a, you know anything about, uh, uh, artillery or whatever, there's a star pattern cut into the thing that varies, that controls the burn rate of the stuff as you go down by burying the surface area that's exposed to the heat. But it looks like chocolate uh, snack pack pudding, and it has about the same consistency. The external, the infamous external tank uh, is jettisoned 14 seconds after the main engine's cut off. And uh, this is the other side of the tank. So you can't really see, but no, this is the correct side. The, if you look up, uh, I'll have a pointer. Anyone have a pointer? 
we really dodged the bullet on the last mission. Um, when, and in fact, had we not stuck the camera on the bipod, which we'd never had before on a space shuttle flight, we wouldn't even, would not have even known that the stuff was flaking off. It flaked off about right there. And, and I don't know if some actually flaked off on that mission or not. It looks like there's some missing, and some right there too as well. But there is, the, the I've done a lot of interviews for the Washington Post, especially after we lost Columbia, and it is pretty much impossible to break the technology down for a reporter and then get it in the paper so that it's really accurate. You know, they talk about the tiles as being a heat shield. Well, it's not. It's not a heat shield. It's not what it is at all. It's very different. It doesn't ablate like a vehicle, like the Soyuz vehicles does, like we did in Apollo and, and Mercury and Gemini. And it is an incredibly well-designed vehicle. It doesn't fly sideways any more than a car will run on its roof or on its side, or if you go around a curve too fast when it's wet. But after this last flight, we kind of agree that we may have one inherent design flaw in the vehicle, and that is taking part of that tank and actually putting it in front of the nose of the orbiter. And in retrospect, that doesn't look like the brightest idea because of what happened to Columbia. This, uh, what can I tell you about this picture? There is nothing that I can show you that was taken in space that even approaches the beauty of what you see as an astronaut. It's so unfair that you guys have spent so much of your time looking at the sky and have never had the opportunity to look out a window and see what, a real, what the universe really looks like out there. It is the most incredible thing that you've ever seen. If you're out in El Paso, Texas, late at night, or out in West Texas, or out in, in the Southwest, you know, one of those clear nights you can see all of the stars, multiply that times a thousand, maybe 10,000, and that's what you see when you're in orbit. Um, and something occurred to me tonight, and I've never had the uh, way to really express it, but uh, that question that I mentioned at the beginning, what is it like? What is it like? I don't know. I was at the Naval Academy, and the reporter said, what is it like? Well, you've never been there. How can I explain? You know, we landed on the boat, we fly in combat. What's it like? Well, gosh, you've never done it. How do I make the connection for you? The uh, the sky map picture image that, that was up there earlier. Uh, when you're in orbit around the Earth and you look out the windows and you can see the rest of the galaxy and you can see the rest of the universe, you have a feeling that you are right on the edge of being able to take a step and go out to all of those places that you always wanted to go see. Go see all of the, go see a nebula, for real. Go see a, a star pair uh, out there. Go see a, all of those things in the universe that most of which, when we were kids, we only read about, and now we actually see images uh, today from things like the space telescope. But you're there in Earth orbit, and even if you went about 239,000 miles farther and walked on the moon, you still are that step away. You know, it's just. It's like walking in sand, you never quite get there. And all of us, you know, those of us that, you know, strapped on a rocket and, you know, they gave us a little gold pen for doing it. Um, those, are the, those are the things that we'd like to do. The Aurora Borealis from space is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. It actually extends hundreds of miles into space. When you orbit the Earth, you're flying through it. And it moves and changes color and hues very unlike it does here on Earth. It's much more vibrant. It seems to move faster, and it's, it's just way cool. And I tell you, it's a really neat thing. Um, this is the uh, vehicle. This is the vertical tail. These are the man orbital maneuvering engines, 6,000 pound thrust rocket engines. And this is the payload bay with the payload bay doors open that you can't see. But it's a pretty good view. When, uh, when I first showed up at NASA, we had two groups of people. We had those that have flown at 24 the times the speed of sound, and we had those of us that have flown at 25 times the speed of sound. And we actually used to wear um, a patch underneath our name tag that said Mach 25. You know, those of us that have flown 25, uh, fastest I ever went was 25.7, Mach 25.73. But we had to go that fast. Our inertial velocity had to be higher to, to be able to fly up the East Coast at an inclination of 56 degrees 
to go to the space stations because the space stations were oriented at the same latitude as the Baikonur Cosmodrome over in Kazakhstan because the Russians launched due east to, max, to maximize their uh, payload carrying capability. You guys know which space station this is? Mir? Anyone speak Russian? Mir means in Russian, Earth or Peace. And in fact, if you uh, have the same cable channel that I have in my apartment, and we're moving in our house this week, thank God, but there's actually a Russian channel on there called, it's Mir TV, World TV. Anyway. Take that to the bank. I'm not sure you guys are writing that note down. I'm taking it with you. Anyway, this is the Russian space station, the third space station of the Russians. We had one before the International Space Station. You guys remember what it was called? Uh, Skylab. There we go. Uh, Mir was a pretty cool thing. Uh, I tell you, the aurora was beautiful, but that a man-made object like this that is flying around the Earth at 17,300 miles an hour, orbiting, orbiting the Earth every 92 minutes, a sunrise every 46 minutes, followed by a sunset the next 46 minutes. It was just a beautiful thing. And to have the, uh, you know, we probably sent five pilots to Mir. And to have the opportunity to go do that, you know, is a pretty neat thing. You know, we were looking at that first picture of the Earth's atmosphere, and it looks so thick, uh, you know, and invincible, kind of like it does here on Earth. But when you get up in orbit, the Earth's atmosphere is actually very thin, and it looks very fragile. In fact, the planet itself looks much more fragile than it does when we're walking around here on Earth. And it probably gives you a little bit of a different perspective than you have when you're walking around here. The, uh, this space station has several modules. Um, if you look right here, you can actually see a crimp in that thing there. It almost ruined our mission in 98 when a, a Progress resupply vehicle collided with the Mir. Heroic efforts, they say the thing. Um, this is a Soyuz crew transfer vehicle, not unlike an Apollo spacecraft, but a little bit uh, more primitive. Three people can get in the thing. And this is the docking adapter that we would dock the space shuttle with, um, the mirror. And you, know, you notice how space stations all have solar arrays? What would be a more efficient way to power a space station? Take a little nuclear reactor. We have them on satellites. It's in a way, you know, there, if there's one place in the space program that we have had problems time and time and time and time again through all the different space programs around the world, by that I mean the Russian and the American. It's the solar arrays, unfurling them, losing their efficiency, and they're not very efficient to begin with even in space. It's actually much more efficient to stick a small nuclear reactor uh, up there, which you can build one, you know, for like, uh, you know, less than the size of a Volkswagen anyway. If you were in space, um, and you could get into your spacecraft and see what it was like to watch this baby come up and rendezvous and dock with a space station. You'd see something like this. Seven people working feverishly inside to make an androgynous docking adapter here and the other side of it here. And uh, I'd go see three, your, three of your best friends in Earth orbit. And I tell you what, if you don't think you're, you know, when you're flying the 240,000 pound mass now vehicle uh, around the world in formation with a space station, um, if you don't think you're lucky, you, you haven't done it, I can tell you. And it is a, from a piloting perspective, it is a blast. <laughs> now, if you, now, you know, a space station, you know, you watch uh, the, the science fiction movies, you know, you read about it in the paper. And Steve Robinson, who's an astronaut classmate of mine, he's the guy that pulled the felt. And let me tell, I'll tell you a little story about that, actually, if you can remind me. Uh, the felt out of the, uh, out between the, the, the uh, thermal tiles on this last mission. Um, anyway, you're up on a space station, you know, three months, four months, five months. Poor Russian guy was up there as a cosmonaut in, from the Soviet Union and came back as a cosmonaut from Russia. And he got <laughs> stuck up there for over a year. But regardless of how long you're there, you're up there, you're with two or three people, and you know, when someone comes knocking at the door, you're pretty happy, like this guy here. You know, you haven't seen anyone, you haven't been to the 7-Eleven for a paper, you know, you just, uh, you're just glad to have some company. This happens to be Pavel Vinogradov, uh, when we visited there in 98, and uh, this is uh, Dave Wolf, and 
he was very happy to see us because we were bringing him home. <laughs> God bless his soul. The, I, I talked a little bit about the space shuttle and how it's constructed. This happens to be a picture of Atlantis, but it's a really good picture to show you these things. If you look around here, you don't see any tiles. Those are all thermal blankets. The black here is reinforced carbon carbon. Uh, you can see the payload bay doors. The vehicle was flown from here in the atmosphere, going up, coming from the Cape and going back. But in orbit, it's generally flown from right here, looking through this over this particular overhead window here. There's a second uh, flight station in the cockpit back here. When this vehicle docks with a space station, it it makes a connection at a velocity of 0.1 inches per second and the pilot is controlling it plus or minus 0 0.01 inches per second. And that's 240,000 pounds of mass. That's a pretty darn good flight control system, and it does fly really well in orbit. In fact, when we would rendezvous and dock with Mir, this solar array would actually be rotated in this direction to get it out of the way, because it was actually sticking in the payload bay, um, such that it was 18 inches away from that window right there. And that's how you rendezvous and dock with it, and that's how you undock. And that's a pretty good engineer, man. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the guys that, that did all that design work, heck, I bet you they haven't asked, been asked to come out to speak to an astronomy club, you know, in 30 years. <laughs> Flying it, uh, a couple of control sticks. Uh, if you know what an F4 Phantom is, that's basically an F4 Phantom gyro with a bunch of uh, extra numbers on it. And the, uh, the digital autopilot is relatively complex, if incredibly sophisticated, and those switches there make up its operation. Pretty good view from the space station when you're flying around it. On uh, STS-89, we, uh, we actually did a loop, what would look like a loop in the atmosphere, 200 feet away from the center of the space station. and. Uh, you know, we simulated it and, and what have you. Never, when I was at the controls, it finally dawned on me when I moved out to 200 feet away from the vehicle and realized that my vertical tail stuck up 35 feet and the mirror appendages stuck out 75 feet. And all of a sudden, I mean, I hadn't thought about this. I'm like, holy cow, we're really close. <laughs> I better not goon this up. But uh, regardless, it uh, is a pretty nice flying airplane. Um, the, you can see the, uh, the a, uh, habitation module. We take cargo up in that and experiments. And this is the document after here. And the guys are flying right there. Just another picture of Mir. When you come back and land, the orbiter, you actually uh, do a retrograde burn. You turn upside down and backwards, and you burn over Indonesia. And less than an hour later, you'll land at the Cape halfway around the world. And uh, you'll enter the Earth's atmosphere. And for the longest time, as you're coming down, as you're falling back down to Earth, and the, you know, the vehicle is upside down and backwards, it'll, it'll be rotating around like this very slowly to finally put itself at 40 degrees angle of attack because it's going to basically ride a cushion of air back into the atmosphere. And it does that for several reasons. One is to produce some lift, and another is to keep the thing cool. And you actually come into the atmosphere with a lot more energy than you need to get back to the Cape, or wherever you happen to have targeted for your landing. And as you're coming back, you'll do maneuvers that you'll hear about called roll reversals, where you actually don't change your ground track across the ground much. What you'll do is you just roll the airplane into an angle of bank, maybe 80 degrees even, and just dump energy. Just fall through the atmosphere faster. You, you dump as much energy as you want. You roll back upright. You know, do it to the left. You do three or four of those things, four or five, as you're coming across the Pacific Ocean to land at the Cape. The vehicle, uh, as it turns and and lands at uh, Kennedy Space Center, Edwards only. Well, we actually landed out at uh, White Sands, but but uh, as the thing is landed, it is actually flown by the most advanced computer known to mankind. It's the only computer ever designed that's able to take all of the systems, uh, all the complex systems of the vehicle into account to account for things like low tire pressure, blown tires, damage to the orbit, or wet runways, crosswinds, wind shear, what have you. And that computer is 
you guys all know the name of it, the human brain, is flown by people at that point because the envelope in which we can fly the vehicle with human beings is actually quite a bit greater than the envelope that we can fly an aerospace vehicle with, an aerospace vehicle with, by computers, by man-made computers. You're coming back uh, down to the earth, all of those uh, black tiles underneath the vehicle, you know, are getting pretty hot, you know, as you're, as, you're, as you're dissipating energy coming back through the atmosphere. But after you land, you can reach up and touch them and they're perfectly cool. In fact, if I had one here, you could take a blowtorch to it and then just press it against your face. It's perfectly cool. It's some pretty incredible technology. Back when, uh, when I was flying fighters, we would fly, uh, you guys ever, uh, let me think, go up near Hopewell, Virginia on 17, Ever happen to be just flying along there and all of a sudden a couple of Navy airplanes come across the road, at, you know, going east to west really fast and really low? We used to fly these, no one's ever, I've seen it. <laughs> anyway, I used to be, I don't know. But anyway, uh, as they go, they're flying these low level routes and we used to do it for tactical training and we do it in all kinds of places around the country. And uh, we fly at about 200, depending on where we're at, 200 feet at about 500 knots. In the space shuttle, this, you get the same sensation of speed as we would have flying a tactical fighter at 500 knots or 200 feet when we're flying at 305,000 feet at Mach 17.2. And if you, ever, if you happen to have the opportunity to look out the window and see some contrails from commercial airliners way down below you, uh, I mean, those things are shoot, shoot, like Star Trek, you know, going by as you just just screaming through the atmosphere. <coughs> okay, why well, would we go to Mir International Space Station? You know, if we ever get the International Space Station fully built, you'd actually be able to see it orbit the Earth in the daytime. Wouldn't that be cool? As big as two football fields, and uh, as big as a football field, and the same internal volume as two 747s. That's so what it looked like early on. Um, human beings going out on, on spacewalks and spacewalking suits, EVA suits, and uh, actually actuating computers that drive bolts, or drive nuts onto bolts, and uh, getting nice rubber seals uh, mated against each other so they can be pressurized, and then guys go live up there. <coughs> you guys know who the first person was to fly in space? Uh, Yuri Gagarin. And I don't have my, uh, my NASA flight jacket tonight, but the, uh, this is a statue of Yuri. And I, 1999, I guess, I lived over in Russia for a year when we were working on the space station and what have you. And at Star City, Russia, the old secret military base, you know, where the, the chief designer was in uh, Korolev, uh, over south, about uh, 40 miles southeast of Moscow, that's where I lived. Really beautiful place, birch forest. I get up in the mornings, go uh, cross country skiing through the woods, you know. And I'd always pass a lake, and no matter how cold it was, I mean, like minus 35 degrees. Uh, and, you know, someone will always ask, centigrade or Fahrenheit? It doesn't matter. <laughs> Actually, so the numbers are about the same at that temperature anyway. If those guys would be taking a dip, I'm like, man, you got to be kidding me. It's all I can do to get out of bed, but regardless. So there was a park, actually, and, and Gagarin's widow, I actually met his widow and one of his daughters, and his, his widow still lives in Star City. She's kind of on the, the uh, retirement plan or something. And uh, there's a park, actually, and uh, there's a statue of Yuri there. Yuri uh, flew his mission and then died in a big 21 accident a few years later. And he uh, uh, used to take his daughter to this park. And, you know, I, mean, I was a fighter pilot, and I was prepared to shoot those guys down at a moment's notice, you know, back during the Cold War. But they're pretty good guys. And um, like I say, he used to take his daughter to this park, and you can't see it. Of course, you can just see snow right now, but you know, flowers, which are very expensive in Russia, especially in Moscow, and especially in the wintertime, um, Jerry Gagarin is still revered in Russia. All the cosmonauts are. I mean, they're like Michael Jordan and, you know, pick a celebrity that still has a decent reputation. <laughs> you know, all rolled up into one. And uh, so even in the winter, children will leave flowers at the feet of the statue. And there has a story behind it, and Yuri, when he took his daughter to this thing in the springtime and the summer, he would pick wildflowers, he would hide them behind his back and surprise his daughter with them. And it's a story that's always been around Star City. And in fact, if you can see the back of the statue, he has a bouquet of flowers behind his back for his daughter. Now, 
So, and this statue raises the question, how the heck do you get to be an astronaut? I wish I had my flight jacket. So how do you get to be an astronaut? There's the airline. John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, Joe Edwards, they all have it. Yuri Gagarin, I mean, he was younger than me in this statue. I mean, he would look just like, just like me by now. Okay. Um, who's the first American in space? Yes, Alan Shepard. Naval aviator, interestingly enough. Second man in space, second American. Gus Chris, he was an Air Force guy. Uh, consummate test pilot uh, around the astronaut office. He is the guy that would have been the first man to walk on the moon had he not died in, Apollo, in the Apollo 1 fire. Great, great, everyone just loved him. The third American to fly into space, John Glenn. He became really well known because he was the first American to actually orbit the Earth. Why? Well, the first two missions, the only rocket that we had that could get someone into orbit was a Redstone rocket. It was actually the lower half of an ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, designed to deliver nuclear weapons over in the Soviet Union. And uh, when they finally got the Atlas rocket man rated, that's the one that John flew. So, uh, you know, I, when I was a kid, being an astronaut is an interesting thing because your heroes, I don't have many heroes really in my life, but your heroes become your peers, much more so than I think any other profession that might have a lot of publicity. So, you know, there I am a kid watching a grainy black and white television, watching John Glenn strap into that Mercury spacecraft when I was knee high to a grasshopper. And then, you know, not that many years later, I'm sitting in a chair in the Monday morning astronaut meeting at NASA, you know, an empty seat next to my right. It's five minutes after eight, so this guy walks in, John walks in late, sits down, you know, he was training for his second flight, and he sits down, and he leans over and he goes, Joe, did I miss anything? I go, no, I didn't miss anything. He said, uh, he goes, how's Janet doing? I go, eh, pretty good. How's Annie? He goes, yeah, she's doing all right. And, you know, that doesn't, uh, you know, where else does that happen, you know, that, you, uh, that your heroes become your peers, and maybe it's only in the space program. This is a rocket that took man to the moon, the Apollo, a Saturn V rocket. The escape rocket at the top of that 365 foot high up Saturn V had more thrust than the original Redstone rocket did that took Al Shepard into space. Three Americans off to the moon. This is the command module, just like you see in Apollo 13, which by the way is really realistic. And the, system, the Apollo spacecraft systems are very similar to those on the space shuttle. So we were about the only guys on the planet that could understand the comm because they replicated the real communications as things were going on. And in fact, I was thinking the other day, I was watching the movie again, and I, I really like it because Tom Hanks is just such a great guy. He actually met me uh, when, when I showed up over in Russia, over in Star City. Uh, you know, just, a, just a great guy. And there's that scene where the, uh, they have the arcing in the liquid oxygen tank and the explosion. And uh, I... I'm trying to think, who's the actor that was over there? He goes over to the meter. You know, everyone is three degrees of separation away from him. Yeah. Kevin Bacon, yeah, Kevin Bacon. And he's, he's you know, he throws the headset on, and Mission Control, he uh, says, uh, we have, we've got a spike. Oh, no, this was the, uh, the oxygen thing. They're, they were getting too much carbon dioxide in their uh, atmosphere. And they weren't, the guys weren't paying attention to it. You know, Apollo 13, they really weren't. And, uh, and so, the, you know, Mr. Houston calls him up and says, hey, check your uh, partial pressure of uh, CO2. And then he floats over there and he goes, yeah, I was just looking at that. <laughs> yeah. And we were just looking at that, Houston. <laughs> this happens to be John Young on the moon. And uh, another good friend, his lunar rover back in the background, American flag there, and the lunar module. Who built the lunar module? Grumman Aerospace, the same people that built my F-14. And uh, on the moon today, there are still six lunar landers there. The descent stage, the lower half, is in great shape. It's just sat there. The ascent stage is in pieces because they all crash landed there, so to speak. But a remarkable, remarkable machine. But also on the moon today are six American flags and the footprints of the 12 American men who walked on the moon, the only human beings in the history of this planet to ever leave it and actually walk on another world. And in fact, those, like I say, those footprints are still there today. And if a year from now, 10 years from now, 10,000 years from now, 
In fact, three million years from now, if we can get back to the moon, you'll still, our children, grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will still be able to see the original footsteps, footprints of the 12 American men that walked on the moon. But about three million years from now, they'll finally be obliterated by cosmic radiation and micrometeorites. And that'll be that. So we've got a little time to get back there, but in the minds of us astronauts, it's uh, time is a waste. Notice anything strange about this picture? Yeah, you guys are in the conspiracy thing. Uh, yeah, and then the aliens. Uh, you know, I, I was in the National Enquirer for bringing back alien bodies from Mir. I'll show you a thing at that, that at the end here. Those stars, come on. Um, it's, look here. John is about three feet off the lunar surface as he's saluting the American flag. And he'll never tell anyone that. Um, he told us that when we were, when we were uh, at first uh, in the program. He's always afraid that someone will think it's disrespectful or something. But I've actually run into a couple of people over the years that, actually, that can spot it. And there's the thing about the shadows, too, right? I was, you know, give me a break. Um, well, I want to show you one picture of things that you guys are really familiar with. And you guys know this picture, I think. You know the history behind it? When, uh, as you know, uh, years ago, when we were kids from ground-based telescopes, there were a lot of, there were places in the universe that appeared to be very dark from the technology that we had to look at the sky. And there are other places where there's, there's a lot of light, a lot of stars. When we launched the space telescope, remember this is a long time ago, uh, you know, if you're a young person and you're, you know, you're eight or nine years old, there was a scientist somewhere around the world who had the bright idea to say, let's take this thing, it's almost like Captain Kirk, you know, on the Starship Enterprise, let's take this thing and point it at the blackest, most remote, empty part of space we can find, and let's take a picture. Let's just see what's out there. And they did it, and this was the picture. And you guys know that, with the exception of this, every speck of light in this picture is a galaxy. And each of those galaxies contain billions of stars, and there are billions upon billions of galaxies in this universe. And you throw in the parallel universes, which is something I kind of subscribe to. What do you think the chances are for life out there? You ever wonder why seven human beings strap on a vehicle, fly it into space, knowing that when they walk to the pad that day, there's one chance in 200 at best one chance in 200 that they're not going to come back. And that's why. Because, you know, it's just that innate desire for exploration that is part of the human species, you know, probably the only species of animal on this planet. So if you were to pick, you know, you look at this picture, it's actually a pretty good representation of the universe, maybe, or what we know about today. You look around and you see all of these spiral galaxies. In fact, we now, well, today we believe that most of the galaxies in the universe are spiral. Probably most of them, if not all of them, have a black hole in the middle. If you were to take, or if you just pick a nondescript galaxy, you know, out there, the spiral shape, and look out on a remote part of one of its arms, you would uh, see a kind of a nondescript star and, and now ten planets orbiting that star. And there'll be one that was different from all the others. And you count three back from the sun, and there it is. It's this little blue and white oasis. And the beauty of this planet for space is something that, can, that I can describe to you, but I never drive home what it's like to see our world hanging in this cold, empty blackness. And everything that we know, every experience that we have, and all the knowledge that has ever been recorded resides right there, this little blue and white planet. And why the heck do we even want to leave it to go explore others? You know, it's probably as God scratching his head, but he's going to let us do it. And, and in fact, we'll get back to the moon, and we will, we will get to Mars, and eventually we'll go explore the outer planets, and eventually we'll leave this solar system. There's no doubt in my mind. It's going to take us a while to do it. It'll take new technology. It, to get to Mars, to start a program, to go to Mars in which we would go there every year, it would take less money than we're going to spend, than we've actually appropriated for New Orleans so far. 
Uh, this country spends more, women in the United States spend more money on makeup than we spend on the space program every year. We spend more on carry out pizza every year than we spend on the space program. Every day, our lives are touched by over 30,000 things, items, that have come from the space program. From cordless power tools that were developed by Black and Decker for Apollo, to digital signal processing that was developed for satellites so that we could communicate with Apollo, to grooved highways that were developed by NASA for airplane runways and are now used on highways throughout the U.S. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Most of them are highly technical. Some of them form little key parts of incredible technologies like MRIs and CAT scans for which the technology is largely unknown to most Americans, but it's completely permeated our lives. And in fact, NASA is the only part of the government that actually returns money to the U.S. economy. Back in the late 80s, NASA used to tell people that they return $12 to the American economy for every dollar they spent on NASA's budget. And the GAO came in and said, oh, wait a minute. We don't believe you. We're going to check this out. And they did their analysis and said, you were wrong. You don't return $12 for every dollar that's spent on you. And NASA said, well, what was your conclusion? They said, well, you return $7 for every dollar that's spent on you. And NASA said, we're done. We'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I don't know if you can read this. Can you? Remember I told you that uh, I had the distinction of having brought alien bodies back from the Mir space station. <laughs> Something I'm very proud of. I wish I could tell you more about it. But the guy on the left is saying that are the recovered alien bodies secured for transport? And the guy, the good-looking guy on the right says, yes, this is going to be the greatest cover-up since Roswell. And so we made this big toothpaste spread in the National Enquirer. And when we came back to Houston, this was, this was covered the doors. You know, the And that's, of course, the space shuttle, the orbiter. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could take pictures like this with our telescopes? Um, but uh, what a, that, that was, that's a Hubble image actually right there, I think. And you guys uh, have even more modern imagery uh, than this one here. However, I actually brought uh, some uh, video from the astronaut office that they sent me day before yesterday, Friday. And I wanted to bring, wanted to bring you the most up-to-date thing that was going on on Mars. So this is what was happening on Mars this week. And there's some sound of this, but we don't have a speaker, so I'll just turn this up. The, uh, there are only two patches that we've ever, every mission patch for a uh, American space flight, and a Russian one for that matter, is designed by the crew and is approved by NASA. So we always try to get some things in there, you know, that uh, they can't, the headquarters guys could never really figure out. But uh, this patch, this is the STS-89 from, we flew in 1998. And uh, there's, uh, there's a little bit of history here. Number one, um, <coughs> This is the crew, of course. Um, this guy, he's not with us anymore. Uh, Mike Anderson died on Columbia, a really good friend. And, uh, but uh, he knew that, like all of us, he knew that we might have to make that sacrifice, and he thought that it was worth it for what he was doing. And uh, the stars in the field here, are there's a star for each of the children of the crew members, and two of which were Mike's daughters. But uh, the secret in uh, this picture is a little tribute of ours, and the NASA headquarters never figured this out, a tribute to Apollo 8 that launched in 1968, you know, 20 years before we did, and we watched that flight as kids. But there's the Mir Space Station and the International Space Station there rising in the background. Uh, you notice that's the bearing straight, and in fact we had a guy from Washington call us and ask us if we changed this and we said why and he says well it looks like a nuclear weapon is going off over Moscow. <laughs> Gosh we never thought of it that way. You guys are pretty suspicious you know. 
I'll, uh, go figure. Okay, well, that's really all I have for you tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.
and let's get NASA back to the thing that does really well, and that is take very difficult problems and solve them in the form of exploration. And uh, so, you know, going back to the moon, which is the plan now to test the technology to go on to Mars, makes perfect sense to me. And, uh, but having said that, it's, it is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. You know, the NASA meatball that you saw, uh, you remember, you see the, the red V that was this on the NASA meatball? That's a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s. Uh, air, or, uh, certainly unmanned vehicles and aeronautics research are very important parts of the agency as well. And we can't just blow that off just to do the space exploration. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think of uh, the shuttle replacement basically going back Words and technology to a capsule um, solution. Does, does that, um, what's your opinion of that? Yeah, well, uh, I, don't, I don't see it as going backwards in technology. You know, it'll be a more advanced vehicle than we've flown before. But if we have to go, if we want to go back to a vehicle that sits at the top of a rocket and it actually doesn't land on a runway, that really, that's really the most efficient way to go to back to the moon and to go to Mars. You don't need a winged vehicle. You need to carry those wings and that vertical tail and all of that stuff with you and all the redundancy associated with those particular systems with you. If you're going to the moon, you know, there's no air out there. So I think that's the right way to go. But it's a funny thing. I mean, back uh, 96 or so, Al Shepard uh, died and uh, second of the, second third of the original seven to die, I think. And we had a memorial service for him at Johnson Space Center. And so, of course, we were all there. All the astronauts came back and what have you. All the old guys, right? So, so they were they called them the old guys. And uh, we had a reception in one of the buildings afterwards. <clears throat> and so everyone had broken up into their community. You know, the moonwalkers were talking to themselves. Uh, the, the original seven were over in their little circle. You know, the early space shuttle guys were talking. And then there was us, you know, the, the middle of the middle of the meat of the space shuttle guys. So I was standing there, and uh, on my left was Rick Lindsay, who's going to fly the next mission. Um, and on my right was Rick Husman, who was the commander of, uh, of uh, the one that we lost here a couple of years ago. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was going through the same old story that I'd done in the past. God, you know, we were born too late. You know, we missed, uh, we missed Vietnam. We missed, uh, you know, the Battle of Britain. You know, same story that you heard from the and, uh, you know, we didn't get to walk on the moon, and, and, you know, we were just born too late. And I finished that sentence, and Jim Lovell walked up. Hadn't heard a word that I said. He'd been way off in the corner with the moonwalking guys. And he puts his arm around me, and he says, uh, you know, I was over there talking to Neil and Buzz, and we are so jealous of you guys. You get to fly a wing vehicle. You get to land uh, on a runway. Uh, you, know, you guys are going to the Mir Space Station. So those missions are more difficult and more risky than the lunar missions. He says, we were just saying, we were all born too early. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's all relative. You know, what can you do? <clears throat> what else? Yes, sir? How much personal stuff can you take with you up on the shuttle? Um, what kind of personal stuff did we take up with us? We, uh, we, you get an allotment of stuff to take up there. And after Gus took his little um, little Mercury spacecraft and the stamps in his pocket, um, they, they came up with some rules after that. <laughs> but uh, I, I took a, what, a, what did I have of interest? I took up a reproduction, a, a, an Indian artwork of Sitting Bull's shield that was done by his great-great-grandson. And in return, he gave me a tomahawk that he made, which that, you know, that's kind of cool. So that thing's back up with the Lakota tribe up in, uh, in North Dakota or South Dakota. Um, I took some apple seeds that were planted in schools around the state of Alabama where I finished high school. And those are still out there. In fact, I'm going to get one of the trees here soon. I'm going to plant it in my place out at Aldi. Um, we, uh, you know, a Naval Academy football jersey with my class numbers on it, you know, 80, and, you know, some other dogs and cats. A lot of things for friends. Um, you know, just uh, just little trinkets and, and what have you. Things that generally were liked. We just, you know, just it, for some reason, if it's flown in the space shuttle, it seems to hold, or flown in space, it has special significance. By the way, we flew, uh, you know, it's not public knowledge, we flew Gene Roddenberry's ashes on the space shuttle. 
not well known. It's, it'll never be publicized because then everyone, you know, want to do it. But all you know, kids like me that were, you know, 10, 11 years old, you know, when Star Trek was on and what had you, we're like, yeah, I mean, for Gene Roddenberry, you know, who wouldn't, you know, do something like that? So uh, anyway, and you, the only deal is, you know, when you're your first day at NASA, you sign a piece of paper saying you'll never sell anything that I flew in space. What else? Yes, sir. Ever play any tricks on fishing control or anything? Or Ever play any tricks on fishing control? <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. Uh, uh, let me see. If there were any, there are probably some inside jokes. Like, uh, you guys ever heard uh, the, about the question, are you a turtle? Was that in the right stuff? I can't remember. Or there's a reply to, are you a turtle? that we can't really say in mixed company. Actually, you hear it all the time now. I mean, it's not a big deal, I guess, but I'm not going to say the word. But uh, well, uh, there was a Capcom, the astronaut that talks to the guys on orbit back in the 60s, called it to Wally Shira and said, are you a turtle? And the thing is, around the office, if you ever ask that question, there's only one answer that you can get. And it's obscene. And, uh, and Wally Shira was not a guy that's to step down from a challenge. <laughs> Got in a little trouble for that. Oh well, that's the way it goes. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm telling you some things, I really don't want you to repeat them. <laughs> I clarify a little more about, um, I've learned a little bit, you know, from various uh, sources about um, what astronauts will do on the space shuttle, but what is your, like, describe what is a typical day of an astronaut? So what you know? How long? How many times? How long? Was, do they have any free time, or are they pretty much busy all day? That's a great question. What do you do when you're on orbit? You know, most of the pictures that you see taken on orbit are actually staged. And you know, how many times have you seen that thing with spinning bananas? Probably put up more damage to us as astronauts than anything. Um, you do do some silly things like that on orbit. Why do you do it? You think? Well, because they're going to do to us the same thing that they did to John Young, is they're going to give us some slides and tell us to go out, you go talk to your schools, you go do a thing for this congressman or what have you. With a bunch of third graders in the room, i got to tell you, man, a bunch of pictures from the Hubble uh, wide, wide field planetary camera ain't hacking it. You know, with those little things, with those little guys sitting on a gym floor. So you do things like that to make it interesting for a wide variety of people. But the fact is that you are working from sunup to sundown especially as a pilot, because you know, you've got the vehicle and then you've got all the other stuff that you have to do. But your, your day is scripted. I, well, my, all my stuff is in my household goods and they're stored away down by the Pepsi-Cola plant over here on Route 50. But give me a week and I can bring them and show you a flight plan. And you know, it's just chock full of stuff. And in fact, they, if you need 45 minutes to do something, they'll give you 25 and expect you to figure out how to do it faster on orbit. And then you have so many things to do. They came up with a new box. We, we just finally called their bluff and said, look, you're just putting too much stuff in there. We can't get it all done. And um, so they stopped putting things into the actual timeline, and they put a separate box, and you'll see it on every day, and it'll say, easy day activities, which means all the stuff they could cram in some other place, and they somehow got it past us. And, and then, you know, there's a whole litany of things there that you have to do. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's busy. On SDS 89, Jim Riley, real good friend of mine, we were astronaut classmates, uh, he was in charge of getting the cargo over to here and the cargo back from here. And I swear he didn't eat for two days. He was so busy. We'd make him stuff, go take it back to him and Velcro it, and then we, you know, an hour later we'd go get it and throw it out because he just didn't have time to eat. So it's busy, 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 busy. Well, what else is cool about being on orbit? Now, you made me think of a couple of things. One is, um, you, uh, when you sleep, you, know, you guys ever watch Young Frankenstein? You sleep like Frankenstein in space. It's the weirdest thing. You, know, you sleep in these sleeping bags, you're Velcroed in, you have to Velcro your arms in, but they work themselves out during the night, and it's very comfortable sleeping in space because you know, it's like the mattress commercial. It's like sleeping on air. I mean, you really are. I mean, it's great. Uh, but everyone's arms work their way out such that you look like this. And I don't know why. No one knows why it is, but everyone, it's, just like, it's just like that. You know, you're straight up. You know, like it's and so if, if, God forbid, if you have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, because, you know, everyone is, you know, all over the place because there's no up and there's no down, 
and it's dark, and so you know, you got your flashlight in your pocket, so you pull it out, you look around, and you get their arms and their legs, you know, it's like a horror movie. You know? and you slip out of the bag, and you float up, and then you go down, and you're underneath someone, and you turn around and finally find your way to the bathroom, and you gotta find your way back out, and they've all shifted, of course, and you come out of there. But when you're sleeping, one of the really cool things about being in space is, um, you know, you're, you're uh, the, the worst radiation that you can get you know, the worst for your body is alpha and beta particles. And the reason is that they're big. And when they hit your body at a microscopic level, they can do a lot of damage. They do do a lot of damage. Well, when you're sleeping and everything is dark and your eyes are closed, occasionally an alpha or beta particle will, will strike and go through your retina. And don't even think about what it's doing to your brain on the other <laughs> side. Or, you know, it came through that way. But regardless, you get this bright flash of light and it wakes you up you know, when those things hit your retina, which is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't worry, you don't think about the damage it did you. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, when you're in space, do you have sort of normal dreams, like you'd be driving your car or something? Yeah, normal <laughs> dreams. Yeah. Or, oh, my of, dreams are never normal. Is that what you dream about? <laughs> <laughs> or, or do you dream you're in space? Um, I tell you, I... We, especially a mission that goes to a space station, the laboratory missions are a little different. So they're lower key, a little different, they're lower key. But when it came time to go to bed, we were always exhausted. I mean, you know, you just you get in, crash, and, and that's it. You know, because flying in space is like flying an airplane. But as a pilot, you're flying an airplane 24 hours a day. Fuel, electricity, oxygen, food, trajectory, orbit, the mission, and it, you know, you are, uh, you know, your brain burns 20% of the calories that you use every day, and let me tell you, you, you're burning a lot of calories up there when you're on orbit. One of the things about mission control is they are not only watching everything that you do, they are taping everything that happens on the vehicle, every actuation of a switch, every movement of the flight controls. And let me tell you, when you come back to Earth, the engineers who have never been in a cockpit just love to debrief the pilots on technique <laughs> and things that they saw you do up there. But uh, so it's it's a, uh, it doesn't reach the intensity. You remember, remember I said a night carrier landing is the most intense thing in aviation, most difficult task in aviation. Everyone will tell you that. Jim Lovell told the reporter that before we flew Apollo 13. Remember talking about seeing the phosphorus plankton in the wake of the ship when you had an electrical failure and all that. Um, but having said that, you, you maintain a level of intensity uh, as an aviator that's unlike anything else that you do. And you have to do it for days and days at a time. And then when you get back, you know, you're just like, oh, I finally have to relax. Still, um, you know, no one's turning down the opportunity to go do this. One more? Maybe up there? Either Maybe one. Go ahead. We'll go for two. Go ahead. Um, Does NASA hold patents? Yeah, they do. Does NASA hold patents? Yeah, they do. As a matter of fact, they have a program through which they want businesses to license their technology, and they don't charge them much to do it. Um, well, a good example is uh, if you guys have been out to buy a hot water heater lately, if you've gone to a place where they've got, you know, the regular hot water heaters we're all familiar with, and then they have this, this hot water heater that supposedly saves you a lot of money and it doesn't need a huge tank and what have you. This was technology licensed from the space program. What they did is they, they took a, a heater and applied it to a very small orifice and they, they jam water through this thing at pretty high pressure such that they don't need a tank of water when they send it up to your shower. They just heat it up very hot through that orifice and then it cools off a little bit as it goes up to your upstairs bathroom you know, and then it's good to go. The, the, uh, the thermostat technology and the heating technology associated with that came from the space program. They have a book, you can see it, see it online, you can actually get it from NASA called Spinoffs, and there's one for every year. You look through the thing, it's highly technical, you guys would understand it. You know? But a lot of people don't. You don't see it on everyone. You don't see it in Barnes & Noble, you know? but it's called Spinoffs. So if you type Spinoffs into Google, you'll find it. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, uh, when I flew STS-89, I, uh, 
I came back and I had a, I've got a cousin who's, uh, uh, you know, I'm a Methodist, but she's kind of like uh, a little more mystical or something, you know, <laughs> religiously. And anyway, so she was, she came to watch the landing, which by the way, the landing's better than the launch, if you ever have the opportunity to go to one. And uh, she was there for the landing, and so, you know, I, I did all the, the debriefing and all of that, and and uh, you know, put on some civilian clothes, and we went out to a hotel for a night before we headed back to Houston. And so we're all sitting there at the hotel uh, restaurant. Well, we were at the hotel bar, and uh, <laughs> eating sushi and what have you. And so I'm, we're there. And, you know, the night's getting kind of late, and I'm a little tired. And and uh, Jane uh, is just looking, 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 just just focused on my eyes all night long. You can tell she wanted to ask a question. And finally, conversation wall. And she had her chance to jump in. And she said, Joe, did you feel any closer to God while you were up there? And I told her the truth. I said, Jane, you know, I put on an orange pressure suit three hours prior to launch. I manned up a four and a half million pound bomb. And for eight minutes and 32 seconds, I rode five rocket engines into space. And three of those rocket engines burned liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen at minus 300 degrees C at the rate of one swimming pool's worth every second for eight minutes and 32 seconds to get me safely into orbit. And I said, Jane, I gotta tell you, I thought it would be better to be intimately familiar with the Almighty before those engines lit rather than waiting until afterwards. 